Hello and welcome back. Uh, this video is a, a discussion of the first three chapters in the Richardson book, Blogs, Wikis, and Podcasts. And uh, as before, I'll use Edpuzzle to sprinkle in some prompts so we can discuss a few of these points, not just have a uh, sort of one-way discussion. That wouldn't be much of a discussion. Okay, so jumping right in, uh, we begin this uh, book by talking about what he calls the read-write web. And uh, I got a couple quotes here from the book. He says, it's easier than ever before to create and publish content on the web, from blogs to podcasts to videos. Uh, this is most certainly true, and it's fascinating to me to think how this is, uh, sort of how revolutionary this is. I, I think we kind of take it for granted sometimes uh, how trivial it is nowadays to record a video like this, put it up on YouTube. Uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago, uh, particularly uh, for videos. Uh, you know, think about how cumbersome it would have been uh, to have one of those big movie cameras and all these VHS tapes around, you know, what, what do you do with those? It's, uh, it wasn't a kind of a distribution system like YouTube that anybody could upload to. Uh, I guess you could try to get on public access television or something, but uh, at any rate, uh, I think it's easy to see uh, how far we've come in, in, uh, with videos, but also for podcasts. and uh, Even blogs are still pretty revolutionary. Uh, I remember when I guess back in the 90s when I first started to hear about the uh, World Wide Web, it was uh, easy to find websites and read the websites, and you know, just, that was easy to access that. Uh, the problem was if you want to put your own website together, you had to know HTML or maybe even JavaScript if you wanted to have commenting or, or something, some kind of uh, dynamic web, so, uh, web page. Uh, nowadays, of course, it's, it's so easy. I think he said, it says at one point in here, it's as easy as sending an email. Uh, which is certainly true. I mean, setting up a WordPress site or using D2L, I mean, there's, there's certainly a little bit of a learning curve, but I think it's within uh, pretty much anybody's means to be able to get a site like that up and running and publish some content on it. So that's exciting. Uh, then he's got this quote from Rushkoff uh, that uh, describes what, what's happening as a society of authorship. It's a little bit of an, a little bit of a subtle idea, I guess, but it's uh, that instead of just being uh, receivers of content or uh, consumers of content, we're sort of always uh, in a position to produce it as well or contribute to it or collaborate with people. Uh, maybe even the authors on, on one of the uh, nuggets, as somebody had said that their students were having conversations on Goodreads with the author of, I think it was a book, maybe. Uh, I don't have the details in my, <laughs> fresh in my mind, but I thought that was a, a really good example of this. Uh, this concept. So I was just, I wanted to stop right here. And what, what do you think about this idea of a society of authorship? Do you think that uh, the, the ease with which we can put content on this thing called the internet is uh, really making as profound a change on society as uh, Rushkoff seems to think? All right, so moving on then, we've got some uh, great questions here on page six. And uh, I want to do a stop a stop here and think about these and see what we can do for answering them. Uh, I think our views of these questions might easily shift over the course of the semester, particularly as we get into some of those uh, later books. Uh, but for now, I think it's uh, well worth thinking of, about them. Uh, the first one is, what needs to change about our curriculum when our students have the ability to reach audiences far beyond our classroom walls? Uh, and I think this goes right back to this uh, idea of the read-write uh, web. You know, there was a time not too long ago when you'd write this paper for a class. Maybe the teacher would read it, uh, we hope. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's where the paper ended, right? Uh, there's very little audience for that paper beyond uh, the classroom. Uh, very little purpose for it. Uh, I guess there's, there's always been like literary magazines and things you, you could submit to, but... Uh, jump forward to today uh, when it's, again, trivial. If you wanted to have students post their essays, whatever it is they're writing, uh, to the web somehow, and it could reach a much uh, broader audience. Uh, you know, is that a good thing? Some teachers have said, well, uh, we need to maintain student privacy, and Richardson gets into that too, right? Uh, maybe students don't, maybe it might hurt them for this work, especially uh, as they're learning to write. Do they want the sort of early writings all over the place for people to to get a hold of might might embarrass them, right? Uh, so anyway, these, this is a big question, certainly something we need to come back to uh, throughout the semester. 
Uh, the second one, what changes must we make in our teaching as it becomes easier to bring primary sources to students? Uh, again, another really interesting question. Of course, uh, primary sources, uh, you might think about books, but uh, this, I think, could be movies or uh, maybe clips from television shows or whatever it is. Uh, and if you think about a digital environment, too, uh, how, how much better it is, I guess, if you have a PDF uh, that you can share with students uh, versus having them to go to the library to go to, you know, uh, the course reserve folder or whatever and get a physical document. Uh, so this is a, another really good question. I, I don't know if we've, if we've really put enough thought into how we might take advantage of this uh, idea. Uh, third one, how do we need to rethink our ideas of literacy when we must prepare students to become not only readers and writers, but editors and collaborators and publishers as well? Uh, this is a really good question here. Uh, I hear from a lot of folks that, you know, as an English major, you might be really good at writing those essays, those personal essays. You're sort of doing all the work yourself, and you get pretty good at that. But as soon as you have to write with somebody else, uh, in, a, in a collaborative uh, sense, it gets to be really problematic, right? And there's, you probably have stories of <laughs> collaborations gone horribly wrong, or somebody not uh, holding up their end, or uh, trying to negotiate about how uh, the writing should go, right? And you can kind of get into a big, big fight sometimes. Uh, but these are skills that need to be learned and practiced and applied, right? So what, what, what can we do as teachers about it? Uh, and then fourth, how can we as learners begin to take advantage of the opportunities these tools present so we may understand more clearly the pedagog uh, pedagogies used in the classroom? Uh, so another great one. He's going to say later on how he, I'll save the point, but uh, we need to be using these things uh, for our own purposes uh, before we try to apply them or have our students use them, right? So uh, these are all really good questions. I, don't, I won't make you uh, answer them all, but I would like to pause here. Maybe you could pick one that you uh, want to talk about the most and uh, see what, what kind of answer would you give to it. Okay, so here we are. Uh, this idea is just talking about, actually, the personal learning first. And uh, I, I wanted to read this quotation to you because it really sort of spoke to me. And I think it will probably uh, speak to you as well. Uh, here it goes. Uh, the truth is that the, that the transformation in my own personal learning practice is what informed my work with my students. It wasn't until I fully understood how these technologies could facilitate global connections and conver uh, conversations around my own passions and how they could help me create powerful learning networks and communities that I was able to see what needed to change in terms of my curriculum and my teaching. Uh, so. Uh, I really think he's he's onto something here. I completely agree. Uh, I was using discussion boards and blogs and uh, you know uh, management systems, all this sort of thing, uh, for my own interest, mostly in uh, video games. Actually, I was part of all kinds of video, especially uh, retro gaming was a passion of mine. Uh, classic game systems and so on. Uh, so I was using those a lot and thinking, and you know, when it came to teaching writing, I would think, well, maybe I could use. It's kind of cool we have all these uh, great discussions about uh, video games. Can I, apply, can I use the same forum software uh, in my classroom and have my students use it too? And it yeah, turned out fine. Uh, had a good time with that. I'm not sure you know, if, if I hadn't had any experience of my own uh, with blogging or, or uh, contributing to a discussion board, if I just was sort of thrust into it, Without that experience, I probably would have said, "I don't, I don't see the point in this, or, or what's wrong with this doing it the uh, old-fashioned way, right?" Uh, so I think it's easier for all of us if we have some sort of hands-on experience first, not really thinking immediately about teaching uh, potential, right? But just uh, what is this, you know, Instagram or Twitter, or you know, what is this thing? Get in there, play around with it. Uh, if it clicks with you and you end up really loving Twitter and you're using it all the time, uh, then it would make sense at that point to start thinking about how you might use it in the classroom, uh, but not before. Uh, so I think this is a good point. Uh, again, I'll stop here to see what, what you think about this idea. So let's move on then to the topics of safety and anonymity. Now this is something that most teachers are quite rightfully are very worried about, especially if they're working with uh, younger students. You know, how can we keep students uh, safe 
if they're online and, and uh, anybody could stumble across their work. Uh, he says that he says it's probably not as the web is not nearly as dangerous. There's not nearly as many dangerous uh, predators and abductions going on than uh, you might think, but still, it's a real concern. Uh, he said we, it's about responsibility, appropriateness, and common sense. Uh, and I guess uh, you know, when I think about internet safety, I'm primarily thinking about uh, you probably don't want to put your personal information or your address online or phone number, you know, somewhere, some way so uh, criminals can easily find you. Or if you're on uh, Facebook talking about the fa uh, the vacation you're going on next week uh, to uh, wherever that is, and it seems like uh, that would be sort of common sense. You might not want to announce that. Uh, you wouldn't want to do that even before the internet, though. Because, uh, you know, you might, somebody out there might be a burglar and decide it'd be a good time to come to your house when you're not there, right? Uh, but anyway, he's also uh, talking about, I guess, the, uh, he's got a story in there, I guess, uh, one of his students was doing some research and stumbled across a uh, inappropriate website. And I've seen it happen uh, to teachers. Uh, you know, I don't think it's, I think I've managed to avoid this in my uh, somehow, miraculously, uh, myself, but if you're up in front of a classroom doing a Google search uh, and sometimes an inappropriate site might pop up there or an inappropriate image and uh, people might see it, your students might see that before you're able to, to back off and uh, get, get off the site, right? Uh, so uh, he says it would just, it's just inappropriate. Uh, we have to, I guess we have to be a little bit more Sounds like what he's saying is we, we need to be a little bit more tolerant, I guess, of that sort of thing, and just, okay, it's an inappropriate site. We hit the back button as quickly as possible and, uh, you know, move on with our business. Uh, you know, I don't know. I've heard about teachers even being fired uh, for accidentally showing uh, bad websites and the like. And there are uh, uh, Google, for example, you could turn on Safe Search. I think it might actually be on by, by default now. Uh, there's these uh, cyber nanny uh, type pro uh, programs. Of course, the problem with those is sometimes they might block an appropriate site, uh, just assuming uh, due to the topic, uh, it might be an inappropriate site. And you think about all the, uh, maybe an LGBT uh, website, you know, it's perfectly appropriate, nothing at all uh, wrong with the site, but it might get filtered out by one of these uh, uh, cyber censorship kind of site, uh, program, <laughs> programs, <laughs> can't talk. Uh, anyway, so these are all real concerns. Uh, now one way around some of this anyway is this idea of anonymity. Uh, so you could, for example, tell students, uh, you know, don't use your real name, uh, just make up a name, uh, you upload a picture of, a cat, of your cat instead of a picture of yourself. Uh, in other words, just be totally anonymous online. Uh, the problem with that, though, he says it detracts from the feelings of achievement and ownership. And I don't, he doesn't really mention this, but I think it might also encourage uh, troll, trolling uh, when people think they could say whatever and not be held accountable because nobody knows who they are. I, I guess you could work it so that you, the teacher, know who they are, but just outside of, the, outside of that, they wouldn't know. You know, strangers coming to the website wouldn't be able to figure out the identity of uh, students. Uh, but anyway, it's, it's a good question to be uh, considering. Uh, when I teach classes where there's blogs, I always give students the option. If they want to uh, use a pseudonym and a, another kind of image instead of their photo, it's perfectly fine by me. Uh, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Uh, do you? Would you be mad, I guess, if a teacher said you had to use your real name or even a photo? Uh, on some kind of web web-based assignment, uh, or would you be okay with that? And what what, do you, what would you do if your students were in the, you know, as far as your students are concerned? Okay, so moving on then into weblogs, and I think we probably all know what blogs are, uh, but just in case uh, you don't, here's a pretty good definition. A uh, weblog is an easily created, easily updated website that allows authors to publish instantly to the internet. It takes as much skill as sending an email. Uh, so again, I remember back in the early days of the web when these, uh, like was it blogger.com, I don't remember what, what people were using back then. It seemed like there was one called movable type. Uh, but this was the, the real appeal of these uh, blogs uh, packages was 
suddenly you didn't have to know all this HTML, JavaScript, all this business, a lot of stuff, all of the work was done for you. So you could just install this blogging software and suddenly you had the ability to make these posts and people could come and create accounts on the site, make comments, leave feedback, have all these uh, great discussions. And it was really, really nice and I guess it caught on and people are still uh, writing blogs today. Uh, he says that something else about blogs is in, that I think is interesting. He says that uh, blogs engage readers with ideas and questions and links. They ask readers to think and to respond. They demand interaction. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm curious why he says they demand interaction. You know, it's not like you don't have to, right? But, uh, you know, you could certainly, I can certainly see a big difference if I'm reading, if I go to, to a blog and I read the blog post uh, versus if I pick up a newspaper and read an article in the newspaper on the same topic. Uh, I do see how that blog makes it so much easier if I wanted to comment I wanted to jump in and have a discussion with other readers of the article or maybe even uh, with the author. Uh, certainly something like links makes a blog uh, different, right? And some of the best blogs, when you're part of a really great blogging community, which I'm hoping we can do in this course, uh, the posts, people are always talking about linking to other posts, uh, either on that blog or on other blogs. And I think that really fosters a, a sense of community it's not like these posts just have nothing to do with each other, uh, but they're responding to, it's, it's basically kind of an extended conversation uh, happening across these blogs. I mean, when that happens, it's really great. You get a lot of uh, great feedback, and like he says here, you know, new ideas, new learning takes place. So uh, this is exciting. Uh, he's also got some research he references, uh, Fernet, and I believe this is Eid. Uh, so they're arguing that blogs if you have students blogging, it's promoting many different kinds of thinking. Uh, everything from critical to analytical to creative uh, to analogical. Uh, increasing access, uh, I guess so they can get access to more information, also provide information to more people. Uh, to be exposed to more quality information, that's, that's a good one. Uh, of course, <laughs> quite a bit, a lot of bad quality uh, blogs out there. Uh, but I think he does right to say and I've heard this criticism about lots of other uh, cyber genres, if you will, uh, when people say, well, you can't trust that information. You know, it wasn't like you could trust everything that you read in a, in a book either. Uh, what we really need to do is not talk about the blogs as being quality or lacking quality. What we really need to be talking about is helping people develop some critical skills, right? Some uh, evaluation, evaluative skills so that whether the information's on a blog or a book, newspaper, or whatever it is, uh, you have some criteria, some strategies for uh, assessing whether that information is, is reliable or not. I mean, I think that's part of our job as uh, teachers. Uh, and then finally, they say they combine the best of solitary reflection and social interaction. And this one here, I think, is really key. It's uh, one of the big differences, I, for me, between blogging and say writing on a wiki or participating in a discussion on a discussion board. Uh, there's this idea that you, uh, when you're as you're writing that blog, you are sort of by yourself, just like you were writing a uh, a piece or a newspaper or a magazine or whatever it is. You're engaged in some solitary reflection first, and then the interaction follows from that a sort of burst of uh, solitary reflection. Uh, and, you know, if you can compare that to let's say let's say you make a blog post, maybe there's a you know, a couple of pages worth of uh, text there, and then people come and read all that, and then they leave little comments and give you feedback on it, uh, versus a discussion board where you're just giving, you know, short little bursts of information. There's a lot more back and forth. It's a lot more like a dialogue. And so I definitely see a difference there with blogs. I think blogs uh, definitely provide me more opportunities to, for sort of a personal reflection uh, than a discussion board would, uh, where it's kind of more about everybody in a discussion versus you know, sort of here's what I think, uh, what do you think about what I think, you know, if, if that makes any sense. So uh, I, I think these uh, researchers are on the money. Uh, ways to use blogs for teaching. I know some of you are using blogs in, in your classes. I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts on these or if you have other ideas. Uh, he talks about a class portal. Uh, again, probably not what most people would use it for nowadays. Uh, most schools probably have something like a D2L or Blackboard 
uh, that they're using. But certainly if you didn't have that option or if you uh, just wanted to do your own thing, you know, you could use a, certainly use a blogger or WordPress to do a class portal. Uh, online fi filing cabinet, you know, that's kind of interesting. We've, uh, here at SESU, we've, we've uh, used blogs for that purpose. And like a syllabus archive, a repository of syllabi, and so all the other uh, professors and teachers could uh, share a syllabi. Uh, ePortfolio is probably one of the best things here, I think. Uh, a lot of students, uh, especially uh, at your level, when they're thinking about going out on the job market, uh, they need a convenient way to showcase their work, especially their digital, uh, multimodal, uh, new media, whatever it is kind of work. Uh, so blogs are great for that. Uh, and then, of course, it's a collaborative space. It's really hard to beat. A little bit more about blog pedagogy. Uh, so they says blogs are constructive as tools for learning. Uh, there's sort of constructing constructing knowledge uh, as you're accessing it, right? And you can search these blogs. And uh, again, this idea that it's not just going to be uh, lost in the classroom on a shelf somewhere, <laughs> end up in the garbage. Uh, once it's added to the internet, then it becomes part of this big thing called the internet, right? Uh, expanding the walls of the classroom. Uh, that's probably one of the most exciting things for me if when I'm using blogs. I love it when uh, we can have uh, people come to the blog that aren't part of the class, uh, maybe teachers uh, and other programs, or maybe friends of the students that are in there, or parents, or uh, maybe just randomly, random people that are interested in the topic. Uh, that's always great when that happens. Uh, I haven't ever had a problem with uh, <laughs> miscreants, uh, but I suppose that would that could be an issue. Uh, archiving learning, uh, this is another great thing. Uh, you know, I wish that I had used something like Evernote or a blog uh, when I was in college myself instead of just writing everything down in notebooks and folders and the like. I mean, those are long gone. Uh, it'd be kind of nice to be able to pull up essays I wrote back in, uh, you know, <laughs> when I was a freshman in college. Uh, that could be nice, a nice way to reflect. Uh, supporting different learning styles, uh, that, that's a good point. Uh, it's certainly easier uh, when I write a blog uh, to put in uh, videos or, or photos, uh, audio forms. Uh, he, he talks about how some students are shy about talking in class, uh, but they're much more vocal, if, if you will, on a, on a blog post. I think that's, that's a good point, too. And then finally, uh, teaching students new literacies uh, that they'll need. Uh, you know, maybe this student uh, will go on to a job that involves a blog somehow. Uh, maybe they won't, but there's certainly aspects of learning how to write a blog and, and interact with the software uh, that'll probably come in useful uh, for whatever for whatever the career they end, end up in. It's probably going to involve some kind of social media, right? And uh, here's a bit more about blog writing. Uh, so this is a question, right? So if you want to have a uh, your students writing blogs. Uh, you want them just to write the same way they would for that, for a standard essay, and then just sort of dump the text into a blog. Uh, this, I think Richardson is saying here, no, we want to do this thing called connective writing. Uh, and he says this will you know, force people to read more carefully, critically, write clearer. Uh, there's a couple of big differences here, especially with the, well, a couple things actually. Uh, so one, Again, this importance of linking, I always uh, when I'm trying to uh, write a blog, I, I usually start by linking to some other earlier blog or some article I read, or, or there's some other thing that I'm writing that blog in response to, and if people want to, they can go look at the original uh, piece first. Uh, and then, hopefully, if somebody reads my blog post and wants to respond to that, uh, they can either do it on the blog, or if they have a blog of their own, uh, then they can link to my blog and uh, link to the earlier one, so you get a lot of connections going that way. Uh, this is a way you can uh, build an audience or find an audience for your work too, right? Because if you're always, if you're uh, linking to somebody's blog, uh, they'll be able to see that and perhaps, uh, hopefully, return the favor, a link to yours, and pretty soon uh, you got a set of uh, eyes on there uh, that might not have been aware of your blog before, but now they're aware of it and they might come over and, and read the rest of your stuff, so that's really nice. 
Okay, so let's see, moving on. I'm going to tell you a little bit here about how I used uh, blogs uh, in a minute, I guess. So <laughs> kind of a, I'll wait a, a bit before that. Uh, all right, so getting started with blogging, uh, teachers who use blogs should, well, use blogs. Uh, we need to experience firsthand the learning we want our students to do with blogs and model appropriate blogging uh, practices. Okay, so here's where I wanted to talk about my experience with blogging. Uh, so, as I was saying earlier, I was, uh, I've got a big interest in retro games and classic computers and uh, uh, video game systems. Uh, so, there was a, a podcast uh, that I was listening to and about that topic, and there was a discussion board that went along with the podcast, and I was always on that discussion board uh, chatting with people of, of like mind, and eventually some of us on, from that board decided that we needed to set up our own blog. And called that uh, Armchair Arcade. And it was kind of a, we kind of saw it as a, at first kind of like an online magazine. Uh, so we just write articles about, you know, cla you know, I remember writing one about Metroid. Uh, but anyway, all kinds of different games and systems were talked about in sort of short articles. And then we got a lot of, uh, turns out there was a big audience for that. And a lot of people would come there and leave comments and feedback. And uh, it got to be really a lot of fun. Uh, that community and I guess what I'm saying is I eventually I learned enough about blogging in that process and sort of how to how to uh, encourage people to leave feedback and comments and I sort of I, I could sort of see how it was improving my writing uh, by having that constant feedback with a real audience uh, so anyway the idea is I, I knew all that going into my classroom uh, before I ever started to think about using a blog in the classroom, I had, had a lot of experience. I sort of knew how it worked. I was excited about it or passionate about it. Uh, so I think it's good for you, too. Uh, if you're thinking about blogging in your classroom, uh, maybe start by creating a blog about a topic. <laughs> it's probably not retro games for you, uh, but just something that you love a lot enough to uh, want to have to talk about it a lot and have a community of of a on, <laughs> kind of have a community built around that topic. Uh, maybe it'd be good to start with that first uh, before uh, putting it into your classroom. All right, but when it comes time to put it into the classroom, he's got some good advice here. And I'll, you can read the rest of this, of course, but I think this point is really important. So uh, before you have students uh, create blogs, have them read some blogs. And I'll certainly do this uh, for you all before we start posting on our blog. Uh, I mean, there's so many uh, compositionist blogs and uh, rhetoric, uh, rhetoric blogs out there, lots of blogs about uh, social media, uh, teaching with social media, or just teaching with technology blogs. And it's really, really helpful, I think, to uh, get familiar with the genre and to see what like really successful bloggers do and, and see how are they eliciting feedback. And, you know, how do, what kind of relationship do they have with their audience? Uh, and it's, it's, you, you just really can't get that information from some kind of list. Uh, you need to actually go look at some blogs and, and, and read enough of them until it sort of uh, sinks in. All right, then uh, finally, we want to wrap up here with some thoughts on uh, grading blogs. You know, how do you grade blogs? I think I saw some of the nuggets uh, were on this topic. Uh, he says he uses a rubric, and this is what I use as well. I have different criteria. Uh, he grades them based on level of participation, uh, so I don't know if that means uh, how often they log in or how many times they post or maybe how many comments they leave. Uh, intellectual depth, uh, this one seems a little dicey to me. I think we kind of get know what he's getting at there, but again, uh, it seems very subjective to me. Uh, maybe, maybe a student thought that that post was really deep, and the teacher says, well, you know, it's just very shallow. Uh, I don't know how you get scientific about measuring that. Uh, effectiveness of writing, again, it seems, I know what it, what it means, but it seems like it could be subjective. Uh, level of reflection, you know, with that one there, I can start to see how you might get more concrete with it. You know, are they mentioning previous uh, blogs they worked on, or are they uh, bringing in readings they might have done in the classroom into their post. You know, does it seem like they're have they reflected on the topic? I think you could sort of measure that in various ways. Uh, and then the last one I think is the easiest one to measure, 
a willingness to contribute to and collaborate with others. So it'd be fairly trivial to, f to find out, did they comment on somebody else's blogs? If so, was it a helpful comment? Was it positive or was it negative? Or just say uh, something like, I like your post. <laughs> you know? uh, so anyway, I uh, wonder what, what you think about these uh, rubrics. Uh, mine, uh, the one I use is I, I talk about focus or the appropriateness of the topic. Uh, the development, which could be anything from word count to sources, if if that's a uh, you know if that's an appropriate one, uh, style, which I guess would be effectiveness of writing, and then also have a conventions and organization. Uh, so pretty standard. I use the same uh, rubric for pretty much all kinds of uh, writing, or grading pretty much any kind of uh, writing. Uh, I think if you wanted to get uh, to get more specific. You know, if you wanted a rubric that was really tailored to blogs, I think you'd need to get at this uh, idea of the of linking. You know, how well have they linked to other blogs, or how do they introduce the context or the uh, exigence, they might say, for that particular blog post? Uh, what do they do to elicit feedback uh, from readers? You know, those are things I might uh, specialize my rubric. Uh, for blogging. Uh, but anyway, very curious what you think, you know, would you grade blogs the same way you would uh, a standard essay? Uh, if not, you know, what would your uh, rubric look like? Or maybe you wouldn't even use a rubric and, and have something else, but, but uh, what are your thoughts at this moment on grading these things? All right, then to uh, wrap up here, um, if you want to use blogging in your classroom, you can certainly use WordPress, a Blogger. Uh, there's one called Drupal. And these are just a few right off the top of my head. There's probably hundreds of different options out there. Uh, and sometimes uh, D2L or Blackboard or whatever it is you might have at your school uh, now or later, uh, they, they might have blogging built into some of those packages. I think D2L has a blogger or a blog tool. Uh, anyway, I would encourage you to take a look at some of these and see, what, see if you like the features. Uh, one problem with uh, WordPress, for example, you can go to wordpress.org, I believe it is, or maybe it's wordpress.com, I get them confused. Uh, you can either download WordPress, install it on a server, and then you can host that server, and it's pretty much, you're in complete control of everything. Uh, the only problem is that <laughs> you're also responsible for everything, and it's a fairly technical process to get that server software up and running and having a stable internet connection. It's just really kind of beyond most people's means. Uh, to do that. It's a lot easier to go to the other WordPress uh, where they host it for you and you just create an account on there and then invite people like I've, I've done with you all. Uh, but there's certainly something to be said for uh, maybe going to your tech people at your school and see if you can get some help maybe uh, to run a, run a package. Because uh, if you're running your own installation of WordPress then you know you can put whatever add-ons you want in there. Uh, if you need to do some customized, uh, customized code that would be an option. Uh, but again, just I don't worry about that. It's too much trouble for me uh, when there's all these free hosting options, right? Uh, but regardless, uh, you would want to think about commenting options. Uh, most packages will let you decide. Maybe you don't want to have comments at all, in, in which case I don't know why you'd even bother. <laughs> you know, why, why even bother if you don't want to have any feedback? Uh, but you might want to decide, for example, if people need to create an account first or the comments need to be sort of put into a, uh, a draft form or you, you need to review them. Or I guess uh, moderation is the word I'm looking for. Maybe you want to moderate the comments before they go live and, and you have lots of options along those lines. Uh, or maybe make it so that uh, if you're not logged in, you can't comment or see other people's comments. I mean, there's, there's lots of options there. And I think you would really need to think about your particular classroom application and, and your students and, and what feels uh, are right to you. Anyway, quite a bit of info here about blogs and the Read Write Web, so I'll, I'll leave it here. Uh, if you do have questions or concerns or comments or anything about something I talked about or didn't talk about, uh, just let me know now. All right, thank you very much for watching this, and I will see you again soon.